The last little section we're going to do before we do more review for the final is this section, 12.6, scatter plots, correlation, and regression lines. Okay, and what this is all about is taking data, well, basically two sets of data, throwing them on this graph called a scatter plot, and seeing what happens with the, uh, the data when you plot it on there, and seeing if there's any if there's any what we call correlation between the two sets of data, okay? There's a difference between correlation and causation, which we will talk about as well. But let's just start out throwing some data up on the board. Okay, this is from your textbook. You don't have to write all these down if you don't want to. But this is a, basically a chart of, or a table of some data here. Okay, and there's 10 pieces of data. 10 people took some survey or whatever. And on the survey, they were asked to put the years that they, of education they had, right, from like, I don't know, kindergarten or something like that. And then they took this other, like, test of some sort that, that uh, determined how prejudiced they were, for whatever that means, okay? And they got a score on that prejudice test, and that's also on the chart, okay? What we can do with this data is we can actually plot it on a graph, okay? And so, actually, I don't have that much room here, but I'll, I'll do the best I can. Okay? On the x-axis, let's put the years of education. Okay? Years of education. And on the y-axis, we're going to put the prejudice test score. Prejudice test score. Okay? All right. So years of education. Uh, what, should we, what should we have along the x-axis? What should we go up to? 16, right? That's the highest. Let's go by twos, let's say. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16. 2, 4, 6, 8. On the final exam, I will give you blank, uh, blank graphs, right? Make sure you label the numbers on there. If you don't label the numbers, they'll take points off. Label them. You should probably also label the x-axis and the y-axis, but I don't think I'd take points off for that. Okay. Anyway, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16. Okay. And then on the y-axis, we're going to have the prejudice going up to, looks like 10 is the top score. So I'll just do it by ones. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 1, 2, 3. A lot of times you can use Excel for something like this or another spreadsheet program. You type in the data, you click scatter plot when you're highlighting the two pieces of data, and it goes boing, and it puts it all up there for you. You can't use that on the final. All right. So anyway, all we're going to do is we're going to start graphing these, or putting the plotting the points, because we said this was the x, x, x values and these are the y values. OK, so for the first one, it's going to be 12 and then 1 right there. Okay. And I, normally, I might label this A, but the graph's going to get a little, it's because I don't have that much room on here, it's going to get a little bit. Um, crowded, so I'm just going to leave the, the letters off the rest of them. OK, then 5 and 7, over 5, up to 7. OK, uh, 14 and 2, over to 14, up to 2. There, 13 and 3, 13 to 3, or right there. OK, 8 and 5, 8, 5, oops, not quite 5, maybe up a little bit more, 8 and 5 there, OK. 10 and 4, 10 and 4, right about there. OK, 16 and 1, 16 and 1 right there. And 11 and 2, 11 and 2 is there. And 12 and 3, 12 and 3 is up there. And 4 and 10, 4 and 10. OK, right about there. All right, so if we look at this data, Okay, if we look at this data, does it tell us anything? Does it tell us if there's if these two quantities are at all related to each other, just by looking at those little dots on there? You're saying it does? Okay, well why? How do you why do you think it does? As time goes on, not as time goes on. What do you mean? This isn't. As the, as the years of education goes up, your prejudice score generally goes down. And I use generally kind of in a, 
um, you know, a very loose term right there. We will actually, we could quantify that exactly. And I'll show you what, you're gonna, what we're going to do to this in a second. Okay, we can actually graph a little line. There's my, there you go. I'll you do it in a different color. With scatter plots, what you can do is you can actually, you, you don't want to connect all the dots. That doesn't actually make sense in a scatter plot. There's no real way to connect the dots and make something rational. What you do, though, is you actually try to get a line that goes as close to as many dots as possible. Okay? And when you're doing it just by freehand, you just kind of got to make a little, you know, you just kind of move your, move your ruler around until you get it to the right place. Um, my ruler's not quite long enough, but I would say it's going to be something along the lines of like this. Your little line doesn't actually have to hit any points. It just has to get as close to it possible to as many of them as possible. Okay? Like that. Okay, would that be pretty close? All right. So on here, I don't know what's from these two today. I don't want to know. I really don't want to know. Uh, okay, anyway, so, so now we've got a line that goes there. And definitely the, the line is downward sloping. And you can see that it goes, it, it, as the years of education go up, the prejudice scores generally drop. Not always true. I mean, there's some people in here who are, have pretty high education but still have a fairly high prejudice score. But on, on average, we can see that there's a clear relationship here. Okay? This means, when you see that clear relationship, it means that these values are correlated. Okay, they're correlated, okay? which means that they, they, can be, uh, they can be used to, to kind of give a general rule. In other words, as years of education go up, prejudice generally goes down. Okay, That doesn't mean that, that, that one causes the other. It just does not mean that the more educated you are, you are, that is what's causing you to be, say, less prejudiced or not. And in fact, there are lots of counterexamples, I'm sure. But uh, the, the whole causation part is not necessarily true. For instance, uh, the book uses a good example about um, when it's hotter outside, more people get stung by jellyfish. Does that mean that an increase in temperature causes people to get stung by jellyfish? No, there's no causation there. Right? There you go. It means they go to the beach more. Right? So that's the, that's the relationship. It is true that if you looked at a if you looked at a graph of jellyfish stings versus temperature, boy, you'd see this nice graph like this. But that doesn't mean you should, you know, stay inside when it's hot out so you don't get stung by jellyfish, right? It just means don't, you know. It just means that if more people are going to the beach, well, more people are probably going to get stung by jellyfish. It's just random jellyfish when it's hot out. It starts stinging more. No, it's not, not, not true. Okay? All right. So this line right here, okay, is called a regression line. Okay, it is called a regression line. Okay. And the regression line is what we call the best fit. And that's one when I was trying to angle it so that it gets closest to all the different points, it's the best fit. Okay? What you can actually do is if you wanted to, uh, you can actually calculate this. And, and I think, actually I forget if I have it on your formula sheet. We do not need to use this formula actually. Uh, but it is on there. It's called. It's under. It's called the correlation coefficient. Kind. Of, you should probably be glad that I don't make yeah. you do that because it's kind of annoying, right? But basically, what you're doing is you're finding the values that make the the differences between all these little points to the line here the smallest. Okay. You're trying to minimize those those distances, and you can do it mathematically. Okay. You can actually figure it out mathematically. Okay. The regression line. We designate it as R, lowercase r, okay? and it, it determines the strength and the direction of the relationship. Okay? The strength and the direction of the relationship between the two values. Okay? If the line went through all the values, like if there, was a, if there was perfectly correlated data, let's say that was a perfectly straight line through all the, all the data points, okay? that would be, well, in this case, it would be a regression line of r equals negative 1. If it happened to be perfectly this way, just straight through all the points this way, it would be a regression line of r equals 1. Okay? And it can go from 0 all the way up to 1, this, this number on the regression line. Okay? When you see something like this, or like the one we have, 
that's a pretty strong, what we call a negative correlation. As one value gets bigger, the other one gets smaller. Okay? If it's going this way, so it's up and to, to the right, it's going to be a positive correlation. Okay? All right, let me erase some of the data tables here. I'll leave the stuff at the, well, it doesn't really matter. Let's do a couple of examples on this regression line. If it's like, if the data is like this, could you still have a line that goes through here like that? Yeah. Maybe? OK. That's actually called a weak positive correlation. Why is it weak? Well, because there's, these dots are all over the place. And it's not very, it's not, most of them are not in a nice little tight like shock group sort of thing, right, around there. OK, this would be a weak positive correlation. And this might be having our value of something like, let's say, 0.3. I'm just kind of making that up. But if the dots are all over the place here and the line kind of you know, meanders through it, um, and there's not, very, not many that are very close, you're going to have a relatively small uh, amount there. Okay? So again, if I'm going to use the absolute value symbol here. If the absolute value sim of, of R is near 1, that is a strong correlation. Okay? If, it is, if R is greater than 0, means as one goes up, the other goes down. Okay? And the exact opposite is true if it's negative. If r is less than 0, then as one value goes up, sorry, I lied. As one goes up, the other also goes up for positive. As one goes up, the other goes down for that negative correlation. Okay. All right. Correlation doesn't always tell you the whole story, though. Okay. If you only have two items in your sample, what's the regression line going to be? Let's look. If you only had two data points in your sample, there and there. What's your correlation going to be? It's going to be 1 because it goes right through both of them. <laughs> right? It's always going to be 1. So with just two data points, you can't tell. I mean, if you had a third that was way out here, well, now your line will be like that and the correlation will be terrible. Right? So 2 doesn't really tell you much. Okay? The more samples you have, the larger the sample size, right? the smaller your little r value needs to be to indicate a correlation of the population. Okay? You can actually get r being pretty small, pretty close to 0, but still have some correlation. Okay? All right, let's see. Uh, here we go. Let's look at this example. In a survey of 572 randomly selected service members, so you know those command survey, command climate surveys we do all the time? OK, so they, they take thousands of, like thousands of people and they look at these. 572 in this case, randomly selected service members. It was determined that there was a negative 0.84 correlation coefficient for years deployed. So years deployed versus job satisfaction. Years deployed versus job satisfaction. Okay? So you also had another piece of data which said that that was for years deployed job satisfaction. You also had another piece of data that said, uh, let's say, uh, salary and job satisfaction. Salary versus job satisfaction. The, co coefficient, the correlation coefficient for that was 0 0.75, positive. Okay. So which variable, years deployed or salary, is a better indication of job satisfaction? Years deployed is actually better. It's a little bit closer to 1, right? Same number of people. It's closer to 1, 
right? And it actually happens to be negative. Okay, so I guess what you might have to do is what? Make people's jobs better. You could probably pay them more. We'd all like that, right? That might, that might make your job satisfaction go up a little bit more if you were, well, not, not necessarily clearly. I mean, you could, you could pay me really, 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 really well, and I'd still not like it here. <laughs> you know? But the, the point is you, you, would, you probably could. You probably could influence it that way. Job, years deployed versus job satisfaction, yeah. I mean, not much you can do there except just try to make the jobs better, I guess. But anyway, um, that's, yeah, that was, a, that was a relatively short one. Let me show you one on the computer here and show you how Excel might do this. Close enough. Okay. Everyone see that? So here's here's some correlation that our data we have here. Okay, we so I'm gonna clean the filter again. Down here we have I don't know why the oh, I guess I didn't put an X axis in here. Hold on. Let's see. On the this is deaths per 100,000 people versus, can anybody guess what it's going to be? Nope. Nope. Some of you guys won't like it. What was it? Guns. That's it, actually. Uh, let me see. Hang on. Yeah, it's actually guns per certain amount of people, but I forget exactly how many it is. Here it is. Yeah, uh, oh, you know what? Hang on. On the bottom is, on the left hand, this is, sorry, the one on the left is actually deaths per 100,000 people, persons. So this one is deaths per 100,000 persons. And down here is the firearms one. Oops. Yeah. Hang on. No, 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 nobody owns that many. It's just, this is firearms per 100 persons. Firearms per 100 persons. Okay, oops, that's what this one is. Okay, so now, it looks like Portugal does not have many firearms per person, right? And they also don't have any de and that many deaths per 100,000 people. Okay, whereas you go to Switzerland, actually, the Swiss actually own a lot of handguns or guns. So actually for like, 40 firearms per 100 persons. They have more like six deaths per 100,000 people. And of course, we're way up here, as you can imagine. Okay, But what you can do in this, in Excel, the, let me show you the actual data. Right? The data looks like this. I just, uh, I just put a little chart. I said the country, firearms per uh, 100 persons, and then deaths per 100,000 people. And it, I just wrote the data, did the data in there, and I selected the scatter plot. Selected the scatter plot up here, and I actually just put a marked scatter. Now, what I could do is I could actually, what's that? This is Excel, yeah. And you can do it with the free versions of, uh, like, what is it called? Open Office or something like that. There's free ones too. Whoops. Uh, hang on. Okay, so then what you can do is you can also, let me see, do a, what's called a trend line, and that's exactly what we're doing. We're doing linear trend line here. Okay, and we'll actually put a nice little line. That's your best fit line right through there. Pretty good positive correlation right there, right? But then again, the, the, you know, the data points are all over the place. Anyone want to guess what R is for that? No, it can't be negative. Negative would be this way, right? Positive. If it was positive 1, it would go right through every point. 0. 0.4, 0. 0.6, I don't know. Guess what? Excel allows you to do that. You can actually say format trend line and then options. And it says display the equation and also display the R value. The equation is actually, there you go, 0.8 actually. The, the equation is actually the equation of that line from zero, to like, you know, if you're actually to draw the line. We don't need the equation right now. But that's it, so 0.8. Okay. Sorry? They got the point 0.8 
from this little formula right here that says, it's the one that says correlation coefficient. And so what they did was they first multiplied all the x values and y values together. Then they added them all up. Then they multiplied by the total number of values. Then they subtracted the sum of the. So anyway, it's this, it's this formula, right? All right, I got you. Okay. <laughs> no, you guys could do it. I, I'm just not making you do it, right? It's you could do all that. It's just this is this is kind of like the standard deviation formula, except a little bit more work. But anyway, somebody programmed it in Excel, and they'll do that. Do we have any of these on the exam? No. Oh, okay. I was going to worry about the <laughs> You don't have any of these regression lines like to fit yourself on the line. I might ask you. I, in fact, there's a couple. I'll definitely ask you if there's correlations or not, and if you have to say, you have to say. You know, yeah, there's a correlation, why, and you have to say why. Well, because look, as the, pop, as the number of firearms per person goes up, the amount of deaths goes up as well. So that's positive correlation. That's all I want you to say for that sort of thing. Okay? By the way, you can also look at this. Does, you don't have to do a linear fit to these things. Um, you can actually fit it to other different types, like um, an exponential curve, right? might look like that. And if you have the R value there, it's actually a little less, right? So maybe it's like, whoa, if you get like 1,000 per person, like, you know, you'll have the death skyrocket. But this is actually a pretty good linear correlation. So, but Excel is cool like that. When I, when, I was doing my, when I was doing my last degree, I had to do this all the time. Yeah. For my doctor, I had to do this all the time, yeah. So I had to do these kind of lines. But, but what was nice is that Excel did it all for me. I just had to type all the data. Or actually, I didn't even type the data in. I had the computer do all the data, copied it and pasted it, and then figured out the labels, and then put it in there. And it went whoop and gave me the, the things. So, and then I got my doctorate. Um, so anyway, so the point is that you can tell the correlations here. And again, this isn't causation. I mean, there might be, there's lots of reasons Americans die at a higher rate, right? We have fast cars. We, you know, we eat, we don't eat so well, et cetera, et cetera, you know? So it doesn't necessarily mean causation. But then again, you know, Canada is pretty similar to us. They just don't have as many handguns or guns in the house, you know? So if you take, if you look at other, other kind of similar sorts of, sorts of cultures or whatever, well, then, you know, you can start to say maybe there are some causation. But in this case, you would just look at it like that. Okay? All right. Any questions on that stuff? No? Okay. We are done with new stuff. Oh. All right, which is good. Um, let's let's practice on. Yeah, let's do a couple. Let's do a little more practice tonight on this correlation stuff. This is actually a pretty pretty short one like this. We've also got the the sheet from last night, and then we can start to go over the. If you want, we we we'll probably have time to start to go over the uh, final exam review as well. Okay. All right. Well, let's at least start this for now for like half an hour, and then we'll go with that. You want to start with number twelve? Sure. All right, let's start with number 12. Why not? Oh, no, not this one again. This one, graph the function, find the vertex, etc. All right. All right, where'd my pen go? There it is. Okay, so we'll take a look at this one. All right, find the vertex. What's the formula? You got to memorize this. This is the formula for the vertex is x equals negative b over 2a. You have to find the x value and the y value because you get points off for if you don't. OK. And in this case, now, is this in the right form right here? It is, right? y equals x squared plus something x minus something or plus something, right? That's in the proper form. OK? If it was something like x squared plus 2x equals 1, is that in the right form? No, you have to get the 0 on one side or the, well, not for the function. It's, for this function, it, it won't be a 0, but it would be y or f of x. But you can't do what we need to do a little bit later unless it's in the right form. Anyway, negative b over 2a. So negative b, that's negative 2 divided by 2 times 1. So the vertex, the x value is negative 1. Okay. To find the y value, remember, this is really y. So we just plug in negative 1. y equals negative 1 squared plus 2 times negative 1 minus 3. Negative 1 squared is 1. Negative 2 times, or 2 times negative 1 is negative 2 minus 3. 1 minus 2, negative 1 minus 3. 
Negative 1 minus 3? Negative 4, right? Okay. So your answer is negative 1, negative 4. That's the vertex. Okay. All right. Let's find the x-intercepts right here. To find the x-intercepts, what do we know of, what do we have to do? What's that? You do have to factor because you set y equal to 0. Because on the graph, right, the x-intercepts happen when y is equal to 0. I've said that like a million times, right? OK, so you now say, so what you have is 0 equals x squared plus 2x minus 3. And yes, you can solve for functions that have a, a quadratic equal to 0 by factoring it and then setting each one, each side equal to 0. I will give you a hint. There might be a factoring like this on the, on the final exam. If you have a, one value up here, like a, some not, not a 1, might be some other value, that one would probably be a 1. But anyway, we'll, we'll practice that next week. OK. What's the factoring going to be here? Negative something. Negative something. I like that. Plus 3 minus 1. Plus 3 minus 1. 3 times negative 1, does that give you negative 3? No. Does 3 plus negative 1 give you 2? Yes. And there you go. So what you've got is 0 equals So you can actually pick the values right off there if you want. But really, what you should do is say 0 equals x plus 3. Subtract 3 from both sides. You get x equals negative 3. That's one value. And then you also get x equals 1, because you get x minus 1 equals 0, or x equals 1. There's your other intercept. Okay, That's just factoring, setting equal to 0. The y-intercept is pretty easy to find. What do you do to find the y-intercept? Set x equal to 0. y equals 0 squared plus 2 times 0 minus 3. So y equals negative 3. Okay. And yes, you will have to graph it. Okay. We're going to graph it. Well, let's see. We know some of these points. This is negative 3 for the y-intercept. X-intercepts are negative 3 and 1. So let's do like 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, negative 4, negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, 1, 2, 3. OK, y, x. OK, so let's see. So now you just put the points on here that you know. You know the vertex. Is it negative 1, negative 4? Negative, negative 4, negative 4. Negative 1, negative 4, right there. That's your vertex. Okay. You know that the x-intercepts are at negative 3, right there. That's where it hits the x-axis there. And x equal to 1, right there. And by the way, those two points are always going to be the same distance away from the vertex. That's the way it goes. Okay. And then you, don't have, you could actually do it with this one, but we could also draw the y-intercept, which we said was negative 3 right there. And now you've got enough points to take your pen and connect the dots in a nice parabola. Let's see if I can do this. There we go. Done. If you ever take a physics class, you'll see parabolas a lot when you do things like shooting projectiles. Or if you're like artillery, in the artillery like unit or something like that, you shoot. All your little, uh, when you're trying to aim a projectile, you have to know some of these like formulas and things. They're all parabolas. Questions on this one now? OK, practice this. We've had lots of practices before. And by the way, you can also go back to the homeworks, and you can practice without changing your score, too. If you want to practice some of these with your homework, you can just ask for other questions, and it'll keep asking you. OK, any others in particular you want to look at? 
Um, we can just start from the top. I passed this out like two weeks ago. So you probably got it, but well, I mean, you can write down the things for now on a scrap piece of paper if you want. And it is online if you want to print out another copy. Okay. All right. Number three, the muffin recipe. Uh, you, why do you guys hate these so much? No, it's so what? It's not hard. I don't. I don't get it. Why? I don't get why you guys hate these so much. I did a little five-minute video on this. Go. It's right on the website. You can you can always get it right. Okay. And by the way, this is like the first thing we did on day one. Remember that when somebody asked about this? Yeah. Okay. Muffin recipe: three quarters cup sugar for three dozen muffins. How much sugar to make eight dozen muffins? Remember, if you forget how to do this, just work it out. Work out the pattern for yourself. Work out the pattern. Okay? You guys know how to do, you guys know how to go from three dozen to six dozen. What would you do? You would multiply by two. Where's the two come from? No, what are you talking about? No, no, no. Where does, why, you guys all jumped right up and you said it's doubling. You doubled it. How do you know? Because you got two set, well, okay. Three dozen to six. Okay, so what does that mean? Where's the two come from? I heard it over here. You divide it, right? Isn't it just six divided by three gives you two? Okay, so what if I said you go three dozen, three dozen to nine dozen? You triple it, right? And where's the triple come from? Nine divided by three. Okay, now we got start to get this. Nine divided by three equals three. So if I said three dozen, do we have to do another easy one or can I go to this one? Three dozen to eight dozen. There is no like you, you don't know what this is, right? But you know how to do this exact same thing. What's it gonna be? You multiply by eight over three. You no, you're multiplying by this number. You're multiplying by 3, you're multiplying by 2, you're multiplying by 8 over 3. Gotcha. Right? So in the first case, 3 quarters cup sugar, to go 3 dozen to 6 dozen, you do 3 quarters times 2. But we're not doing that anymore. Now we're going 3 quarters times 8 thirds. 3 fourths times 8 thirds gives you 24 twelfths, which is what? So how many cups of sugar? Two cups. Two cups of sugar. Right. Let's just do one more of this. What if you had three dozen to 1.5 dozen? You're what? You're halving it. Where'd the halve come from? 1.5 divided by 3 gives you 0.5. You multiply by 0.5, which is the same as saying multiply by a half. Okay? All a pattern. And I never want to hear you guys like making bad recipes again. Now you know how to change. Next week you can bring cookies in. Because we all have ovens in our clues. <laughs> What's that? You, you just wing it? All right. All right. So we've done three. Okay. What else do you want to do? Anything else on this page? This one? This one, I, I bet a bunch of you guys would like get kind of annoyed at this one. It's not that, it's not that hard. You just have to solve for it. X. Right? Yeah. Hang on. Distribute that, so it's going to be 4x minus 8 equals 9 minus 2x plus negative 2. Yeah, don't forget to do that. Don't forget to do that, right? Or it's just 2x minus 2. It doesn't really matter. Negative 2x minus 2. All right, then what do you do? Take how many x's from both sides? You could add, you could subtract 4x from both sides. I'd, I'd rather add 2x to both sides. Because that'll make a positive x on this side. 6x, yeah, you'll do that in a minute. 
9 minus 2. So can I just make that 7? OK, now what do we do? Add 8 to both sides. 6x equals 15. And then 5 by 6. x equals 15 sixths. Six. I can't say that. Or how about, just, how about just divide both by 3, first of all? 5 halves. Yeah. And then if you want to convert it to 2 and a half, you're, you're welcome to. But by the way, that little blue calculator has a fraction function on it I found the other day. Really, it's kind of silly, but it's, you know, hey, it's got it on there if you want to figure it out. OK, any questions on that? Solving for x, classic algebra. And it does convert decimals to fractions for you as well. What does it say for point nine 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 repeating? OK, all right, we just did this. What does it say one? There you go. Uh, a 30-year-old worker, OK, we can do it. This is just on the test, right? 30-year-old worker plans to retire at age 65. So that's actually, this is a good question, because first of all, you can't just use 30 or 65 in the equation, can you? How many years, what's t going to be equal to in this case? It's going to be 60 minus 65 minus 30, which is going to be equal to 35 years. Right? 35 years. It says, uh, he believes that $500,000 is needed to retire comfortably. How much should be deposited now at 3.5% compounded monthly to meet that $500,000 goal? You have to be able to read your sheet to figure out what, this, what you're looking for. It says, how much should be deposited now? If he had a whole bunch of cash right now, this is not an annuity. It's not something where he keeps putting money in. He says, I want to know now how much I have to retire with. If I put it in right now and I could make 3.5%, right? Well, how about future value for compound interest? Because we're compounding it, right? Future value for compound interest. It's this one. A equals present value. No, it's not. It's not the future value. We, this is the future value, isn't it? We need to know the present value. Yeah. Yeah, present value equals the future value divided by 1 plus the rate over the number of times per year raised to the number of times per year times the total number of years. And then you just crank through that, right? 500,000 divided by 1 plus. The rate is 0 0.35. 0 0.35 divided by 12, because it's compounded monthly, raised to the... 12 times 35 years. Okay. How come what? No? That's somebody had a question about that. And you can do this all at once on your calculator. One plus 12. I got $147,140.97. If you have that much money in the bank, yeah, you're doing all right. Yeah? No? Did you get it? No. <laughs> Why not? You remember to do parentheses here and parentheses here? Yes. No, you didn't. I did. I didn't have to do that. <laughs> Try it again. <laughs> yeah, this is a little tricky. It's only tricky in your calculator. A bunch of you guys kind of mess it up on your quiz. Yeah, I hear you. OK. <laughs> Pacific yellowfin tuna. Normal distribute, you want to do this one? OK. So for Pacific yellow tin, yellow fin tuna, right? You use your formula sheet for this. And you say, I can do this if I know the z value. 
So you know the z value equals the data point minus the mean divided by the standard deviation. And we get all that information, right? So for a 50 pound, less than 50 pounds, 50 minus 68 divided by 12, right? So 50 minus 68 is 18 divided by 12. Negative 1.5, thank you. Negative 1.5, that's the z value. And you look at, look at your formula sheet for negative 1.5, and it says 6.68, 6.68 percentile. Yeah, I would not write it like that. You just say 6.68%. And what's nice about the way this question was asked, what percentage have a weight less than 50 pounds? Well, that's what this gives you. If it had said what percent is above 50 pounds, you'd have to do 100 minus that. Okay. What's squiggly line? Oh, TH, 6.68 percentile. You can just write 6.68% 6 less than 50 pounds. Okay. Good? All right. Okay. You have anything you want to do? Here's one that's not in the correct, quite the correct format. Right? This one's just a, a line, not a parabola. But it's the same, mostly the same thing. To find the x-intercept, what do you do? Set y equal to 0. So you can just do it right here. 4x minus 2 times 0 equals 8. So we've got that leaves us 4x equals 8 or x equals 2. Right? So our x-intercept is actually 2 comma 0. For the y-intercept, same business, except you make the x equal to 0. 4 times 0 minus 2y equals 8. Negative 2y equals 8. So you get y equals negative 4. 0, negative 4. To find the slope, you could do a couple of different ways. You could solve for y. If you solve for y, you end up with slope intercept form, which is nice. Or you could just use these two points and do the slope formula. y2 minus y1, negative 4 minus 0. x2 minus x1, 0 minus 2. Negative 4 over negative 2 equals 2. There's your slope. And if I said, put it in y equals mx plus b format, slope intercept format, you'd say y equals, let's see, 2x because our slope, and the at y intercept is negative 4 minus 4. There's your, y, there's your format. And if you, re, if you solved this for y, you'd get the exact same thing. Okay. Okay. And then graphing it, well, you know enough points to do this. Right? You know that you've got 2, 0, 1, 2, 0, and you've got 0, negative 4, 1, 2, 3, 4. And you could just do a line right through that. That's the easiest way to do it. Or you could, you could pick one of them, the y-intercept, let's say. And then you could say, oh, OK, I can go up 2 and over 1, up 2, over 1, up 2, over 1. And you draw a line through that. Not hard. Questions on those ones? Yeah, you guys got this stuff. I think we should probably do some of the uh, probability ones. Those get a little tricky. Let's do, let's see. Is there a probability one on here? Um, here we go. Well, I don't make the exam. No. No. Nope. Made by the head guy in wherever he lives, Spain or something. The names of ten men and seven women are, women are entered in a sweepstakes drawing. 
two names are drawn at random in succession. What's the probability that the first name is a man's and the second name is a woman's? Two names in succession. Probability that the first is a man's. Well, what do you know about this? Ten men and 17 total. So to, the probability of picking a man first is going to be 10 out of 17. Okay? And then you're picking another one. So now you've already picked one. And when you, when you do two in succession, you multiply the probabilities. So now you want to pick a woman's name. So how many women are there left? Seven. Seven. You didn't pick any yet. And how many people are left? Sixteen. So when you do that, you get 70 out of whatever 17 times 16 is. Two, well, I can't, I can't do that one in my head, unfortunately. 272. You've already picked one person. So that person's out. So there's no more people there. That person's not part of the total anymore. Okay. And then let's say both names are women's. What's the first number we're going to multiply by? If, the, if we instead wanted both names to be women's. There would be 7 out of 17 times 6 out of 16. Okay. The first time, there's 17 total people and you want a woman. There's only 7 of them. So your probability of picking a woman is 7 out of 17. The next time you choose, there's one woman already out and there's one whole total person out. So now you're down to 6 out of 16. Okay, because you want two women. Check. Yep. Got it. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Next week, I'll, I'll have some other ones um, that are a little more like this, or that, that are similar to this, but more, uh, a little more involved, a little bit more involved. Okay. All right. Let's look at the, uh, the graph one here. Didn't we, we did this last week, I thought. Let's look at it again. OK. Remember, remember what I said to do for these ones? I add them all up going right to left and then top to bottom. right? So and I added it wrong before. This is 40, I think. And this one is 38. And this one is 22. Okay, And then you add them this way. And I think it's 50 and 50, maybe? 50 and 50. 50 and 50. And then you 100. It should add up to 100 this way and down. OK. And then you can use those numbers when you're trying to figure this out. OK. Find the probability that a randomly selected student does not have brown eyes. OK. Well, you can do this a couple different ways. You can say, all right, having brown eyes is 40 out of 100. Does not have brown eyes, remember, probability of not having brown eyes, we'll call it, is the same as the probability of probability, sorry, 1 minus the probability of having brown eyes. So it's going to be 1 minus, what's the probability of having brown eyes? 40 out of 100. Or that's just 60 out of 100. Or 6 tenths. Or 3 fifths. Automatically does it on your calculator? That's nice. Sometimes <laughs> All right. OK, so let's see. That's any questions on that one? When I did 1 minus 40 over 100, that's 100 over 100 minus 40 over 100. 100 minus 40 is 60. Or you could have done this. Well, how many people don't have brown eyes? 38 plus 22, that's 60 out of 100. It's the same idea. Strong, Nadi. <laughs> Don't give me the evil eye. You're not getting this. This is. Well, no, that, that's all right. That's all right. We we can talk about it if you want. Let's look at the next one, and we'll see if the next one makes a little more sense. Okay. Any more questions on this? One? All right. Okay. Now we're looking for the probability that the person has brown <laughs> eyes or blue eyes. Okay. Brown eyes or blue eyes. Well, you can do it a couple different ways. You can say, OK, people with brown eyes, probably the brown eyes is 40 out of 100. Because it's 40 out of a total of 100 students. 
add, because if it's or, you're going to add them together, 38 out of 40, I mean 100, 38 out of 100 to give you the blue-eyed people. 78 out of 100. Right? OK. Questions on that one? OK, let's look at the next one. All right. What is the probability that the person is female or has green eyes? Well, that's going to be what? That's going to be the female is this row. Okay? So that's going to be the female one's going to be 50 out of 100. Right? How about green eyes? It's going to be 22 out of 100. But didn't we just double count those 12 people? Yeah, we said that the, those 12 people counted in the female and counted in the blue eyes. So you subtract out the 12 extra people out of 100 that we have to do. Okay. And so it's going to end up being, what, 60 out of 100? So you, were, you said you were minus the 12 females? Yeah. Because they're included both times you counted. You counted there and you counted there, so you double counted them. Okay. Yeah. You don't want to double count them. Okay. All right. And then finally, what's the probability that, that the student is male, given that the student definitely has blue eyes? Well, forget about the brown-eyed ones and forget about the green-eyed ones. Because you know that you're only dealing with this column. Probability that's male, given that it's blue eyes, 18 out of the total now, which is just 38. Yeah? Tony, you getting that? Kind of, sort of. Kind of, sort of? You can practice it some more. I'll give you some more examples next week. How's that sound? I'll do it Thursday and on Saturday. Yeah. OK. All right. All right. We know how to type these things into the calculator. Oh, that's why I got those wrong. Uh-oh. Do not know how to type them in the calculator? A lot of times they will ask you a question like this. They'll say, t is the time in years since some date. And you'll have to do a subtraction to get the actual number for t, or number of x. In this case, it just says, what's p of 12 in this case? So we just plug in 12. 3,600 divided by 1 plus 7e to the negative 0 0.05 times 12. And then that whole thing is going to be in parentheses, by the way. Um, careful on some of your calculators. When you type the little E button, some of the calculators actually put the little caret in there for you. Some of them don't, but it means that. Yeah, you just got to be careful. The blue calculators, the TI ones, put the little caret. The other ones don't, so you got to be a little careful on that. Okay. And this gives you what value? Seven, what is it? Don't give me in halves. How about decimals? 3,600 divided by 1 plus 7e uh, to the x, negative 0 0.05 times 12. 743.5. Parentheses? Uh, you do not. But you should put parentheses after the 3,600, because the bottom, you're, the whole thing is getting divided. Yeah. Yeah. Did you guys get that now, 743.5? OK. Good.
Robert, you getting this one? I'm sure you do the E. It's got it on there. There's probably two E's on that calculator. One should say E to the X. That's the one you want. And then you might have to hit shift or something to get there. This three on the last test. This three on the last test? Mm. I'm sorry to hear that. 743.5. Can't do it, stick around after class and we'll look at it. Or come Thursday and we'll do it. Okay. Yes. Number eight. Ah. Okay. Number eight says you are taking a multiple choice test that has five questions. Each of the questions has three answer choices with one correct answer. You select, if you select one of these three choices for each question and leave nothing blank, in how many ways can you answer the questions? Oh, shit, but <laughs> well, yeah, just don't, uh, you know, nothing blank would be another way to answer it, let's say. So we're not pretending there's, there's only three choices, not four. Right. Right? Okay. So the first question, right, how many different ways are there? Three. The second question, how many ways are there? The third question, how many ways are there? Three. 27 different ways. Wait, you said five. Oh, five? Okay, I got you. Three times three. I thought it was three. So not 27. 27 times nine, which is no, 200 something? Yeah, it is. But yeah, th there will be a couple questions where you, where you do that. Yeah. How many questions on it? 20. It is 20. Oh no, there's only, there's only gonna be like one question, but there's gonna be a couple questions where you have to really read the question carefully. Because no. sometimes, they, I, I bet there's gonna be a couple questions where you'll, you'll look at it and you go, I have no idea how to read this question, but you just gotta do the best you can and try to, try to figure it out. Okay. All right, let's see. Scatter diagram, we just did this. Does there appear to be a positive, negative, or no correlation? This one you just gotta you just gotta crank this one out. One, two, three, four, five, uh, six, seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. You just do twelve, eleven, twelve, twelve. And you just crank it out. Three, three, five, twelve, seven, four, uh, Oops, I'm doing it wrong. I'm doing it backwards. Sorry. X three five three five seven twelve uh, two four six ten and five six like that. Positive, negative, or linear? Positive. Top number is the x value. This way. And the bottom number is the y value this way. Okay. Yeah. Now, if you flipped it, you'd get a very similar graph. You might get it like this instead of like that, but there's still going to be a positive correlation. As one goes up, the other goes up. That's the correlation. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, this one, a couple people asked me about this question. This base, this uh, football game one. Yeah, this one's a little, this one's a little tough to understand. Here's some formula that describes the number of games, football games, n. That's the number of games played in some league with t teams. So that's the number of teams, and in fact, that's the number of teams too. The t on there is the number of teams. Okay. If each team is to play every other team once, that's kind of cool. Okay, so a lot of times you want to do that, right? You have six teams in the league. Everybody wants to play everybody else once. You know how many different? Uh, is it once? Yeah. Yes. Use this information to find the number of teams that belong to a league which has 36 games. Okay. So in this case, they don't give you 
t, they give you the number of games. You want to find out how many teams there are. 36 equals t squared minus t divided by 2. Multiply each side by 2. That's a good way to start. 60, sorry, 72. 72 equals t squared minus t. 36 times 2. I multiply both sides by 2. Subtract 72 from each side. You get 0 equals t squared minus t minus 72. Does that look familiar? Yeah. Does. Right? Factor it. T, t. What goes into 72? 8 and 9. Let's just try it. 8 and 9. Is there a way to make 8 and 9 adding or subtracting or whatever to get negative 1? I like it the other way around. Plus 8 minus 9. How's that? So that means set each side equals 0, and you get t equals negative 8 and t equals 9. So what this means is there's either negative 8 teams or there's 9 teams. And in the real world, which one is the only answer? 9 teams. Okay. So if you have 9 teams, then there's going to be 36 total games played. Okay. When each team plays every other team once. Can you check if that's true? Or can you check the, can you check the answer? Yeah, you can show, totally check the answer. Plug t in up here. n equals t squared minus t divided by 2. So you get 9 squared, which is 81 minus 9 divided by 2. 81 minus 9 is 72 divided by 2, or 36. It would also work with negative 8, but that wouldn't make sense in terms of number of teams. Yeah. Yeah. Uh. OK. All right. Let's do, uh, let's do one more, and then I'll let anybody go who wants to go. You guys look like you're flagging tonight. Like you're flagging, like you're kind of, you know, yeah, about to, about to head on the table sort of thing. OK, we did that. Ooh, this is an interesting one. A baseball franchise is owned by three people. The first owns 5 twelfths of the franchise. The second owns 1 third. How much is left? Well, what's the total in fraction form of a, of a team? There's one team. So don't you have 5 twelfths plus 1 third plus some other amount for the other person equals 1? Yeah. I, here's how I would do it. I would say I'm going to end up getting this 12, getting rid of this 12. So let's make the denominator for all of these 12. That's what I would do. This one already is. How do I make this one 12? Multiply by 4, so I multiply the top by 4. 4 twelfths. How do I make 1 x over 1 equal to 12? Multiply by 12. 12x 12 over 12. How do I make 1 over 1 on the bottom 12? Multiply by 12. 12 over 12. And then the nice thing about this is all those Bob denominators go away. You can just get rid of all of them. One swap. Yep. Because what you could do is, well, you could do a bunch of things. But one, I mean, you just know that if everything's by 12, you can just get rid of the 12s there. Okay. Or you just, yeah, you can multiply everything by 12, and that would get rid of all the bottom 12s. So you're left with 5 plus 4 plus 12x equals 12. 9 plus 12x equals 12. Did you say, what did you say? Yeah, 12x equals 12 minus 9, or 3. 12 minus 9 is 3. Divide by 12, so you get 3 twelfths. x equals 3 twelfths, or 1 fourth of the team. Right? So one fourth of the team, yeah. If you if you look, five twelfths and one third actually adds up to three fourths. 
because 9 twelfths is what you start with, which is 3 fourths. So the other person owns 1 fourth of the team. Some franchises are like this too, by the way. There's one, there's one team that's not owned by like two or three people. You know what team it is in the professional thing? What is it? It's the Packers. Green Bay Packers are owned by the people. You can buy stock in the Green Bay Packers. That's okay. You can actually own part of the team. <laughs> it's kind of cool though, you know. You own it. Do, you, do you know anybody who owns stock? I wonder what the stock goes for right now. Which one? Green Bay Packers. I don't know. You can probably look it up. Yeah. Okay. All right. I said that was it for what we know. Um, if you guys want to stick around, we can. We can go over more of these next week. I on Thursday and also on Saturday we'll do the uh, other the other stuff. Um, you're going to take the test this week. Did anybody else want to take the test to get it out of the way before studying on Thursday or Saturday? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Do it Thursday. Like after the, it's two and a half hours. Long exam. I'll make it happen. Twenty what questions. Time, what time I need to be <laughs>